Hello everyone, welcome once again to our lectures. Uh, today we'll be talking about steroids and icosanoids. Uh, and we are coming to a close in our discussion on the lipids, so we're getting to a close. In fact, after this, the next lecture after this will be basically on uh, li lipoproteins and cholesterol transport. And that, that subsequent lecture will be the end of our our discussion on lipids. Let's immediately start up our lectures here, the steroids and icosanoids. As usual, I have a beautiful quote, this time from uh, one of uh, the, one of our own in the United States here, an African-American, uh, George Washington Carver. Let's hear what he has to say. He says, when you do common things in life in an uncommon way, you will command the attention of the world, George Washington Carver. Let me talk about a little bit about George Washington Carver. You understand why he says, if you take a when you, when you take a common thing and, and do it in a common way, you you command the attention of the world. You command the respect of the world. George Washington Carver was an American agriculturist, an environmentalist, a scientist, an inventor, and a professor. He was the one that promoted alternative crop to cotton and other methods that will prevent soil depletion. He wants to improve agricultural products so that soils will remain rich while agricultural products are going on. In fact, in the 20th century, he was thought to be the most prominent scientist in the early part of the 20th century. And he lived and survived in a time of um despicable racial polarization and yet he was able to make his mark george washington cover of the blessed memory let's immediately take off the lecture from here uh the learning objective we intend to cover today include number one we're going to identify typical steroid we're going to understand when you say a steroid what is the basic unit of every steroid if it's a steroid hormone if it is cholesterol, what is that typical steroid structure? Number two, we'll describe, okay, I've said this one. We'll describe the functions of steroids in the body. There are so many of them that play an important role. We're going to see them. And then lastly, we'll describe the biological and therapeutic uses of icosanoids. So we're going to see this as we move on. Let's immediately take it from there, the steroids. Steroids are compounds with four fused ring system the four fused ring structures now three of those rings are six number three they look like they look like hexane kind of but you know they look like hexane that's exactly if you look at it this is the hexane ring so it has three a kind of three hexane ring and one five me, me, five member ring which is what and pentane ring now these three hexane rings are fused together with the pentane ring to form what we call the steroid nucleus or the steroid ring system. In fact, this is A, this is the first hexane here, fused with another one B. This is the C, the third one which goes up, and then you have the pentane as the D. So this is what we call the typical st structure of the steroid. And we say this particular ring system is called the steroid nucleus, or you can say the steroid ring system. Now, of course, just like lipids, they are soluble in non-polar solvent. They are soluble in non-polar solvent like water, but will only be soluble in the like I said, they are soluble in non-polar solvent. Sorry, I walked that back. They are soluble in non-polar solvent like diethyl ether or chloroform, but insoluble in water. Water is a polar solvent, they are insoluble in water. Like I said. Just like other lipids, they are very non-polar solvent and only soluble in non-polar. Uh, they are non-polar solute rather than only soluble in non-polar solvent. Okay, so they include the following: the cholesterol, the bile salt, and the steroid. So these are the major classes of the steroid we are going to be looking at in this class: the cholesterol the bile salt and the steroid and let's immediately take it off there cholesterol cholesterol is the most abundant steroid in the human body 
it is highly hydro highly hydrophobic as usual if it's highly hydrophobic what it means is that it is non-polar it is a component major component of the cell membrane that produces it that 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 gives the cell that sense of rigidity we talked about this when we talked about the 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 lipid membrane we said the cholesterol fits inside the what inside the tails the tails of the phospholipid bile in the middle now it is a precursor of other steroid in fact you make other steroids from cholesterol you, this is like the basic unit of steroid and it's also present in food particularly in animal sources the animal sources are full in cholesterol while the plant sources are full filled with uh, less uh, have plant sources have less cholesterol than the animal sources now they are synthesized in the liver cholesterol is primarily synthesized in the liver and in fact there, there exists a strong link between cholesterol levels in the in the blood and atherosclerosis which is the hardening of the arteries so having to, eating too many cholesterol can engender or lead to increase in blood cholesterol and that has been linked to atherosclerosis which remains a, a major disease that causes fatality in the united states and the world okay so let's look at the structure of the cholesterol again like i said it has the basic a b c d that steroid nucleus and there you now have addition for so you have an oh group at this point and you now have this this connection here this is a one two three four five six seven and this eight so you have this connection at uh, from this pentan ring and you also have metal group at this point and at this point so this is the basic structure of cholesterol and in fact particularly for assessment you need to memorize the structure of just the cholesterol that is the only one need to memorize this is the only one i will ask you to memorize in all the ones we'll talk about memorize it and i can ask you to label parts of this cholesterol you should be able to do that okay we now go to the next one the bile bile is a yellowish brown or green liver secretions it's actually secreted by it's produced in the liver and secreted by the liver as well so it is produced in the liver and then it is stored in the gallbladder the gallbladder is where it is stored and when it is needed the gallbladder releases so bile contains bile salt which will be our most interest what are bile salt bile salt include two main types of bile salt there are a lot of all of them but these are the two common ones we're going to be looking at here the sodium glycolate the sodium glycolate and the sodium thyrocholate now just like lipids they are amphipathic in nature having one part to be polar and po okay let me use better word having one part to be hydrophilic and the other part to be hydrophobic now what is the function of bile salt what they do is that they emulsify lipids in the intestine by providing by what breaking large lipid globules into the smaller droplet and what does that mean what they do is that in this process by breaking this you provide large surface area provide large surface area for these lipids to be broken down by the enzymes lipase the lipases are enzymes that break down lipid to break them down into fatty acid and glycerol so what the bile salts do is to prepare them for this particular break down so i have two examples of the common bile salt i told you about uh sodium glycocholate is pictured here and sodium thyrocholate is pictured here you're not expected to memorize this structure but what i want you to memorize here is that if i give you this an assessment you should be able to tell me which part is hydrophobic and which part is hydrophilic now let's look at it you see this is carboxylic group co coo is from carboxylic acid which is definitely a polar one and just making this thing a salt makes it kind of ionic so this is the polar area so if i ask you to circle which side is hydrophilic you circle this side. so this point is the hydrophilic region and then the whole of this remaining side is the hydrophobic hydrophobic region the hydrophobic region and the hydrophilic region you should be able to do this when i ask you to do this in exam again the same thing here you're going to label this one this is sodium thyrocholate the difference between this one is that you see this one has coo minus here this one has so3 minus that's the difference between the major difference between the two of them if you if not every other thing is almost the same every other thing is almost the same apart from those two areas 
I just told you about. So now if we do that, what are we gonna do? So then the same thing here. So if I circle, if I circle this part again, and then what else again? This is the hydrophilic. And then I can circle this part again. Of course, this is a hydrophobic. So you should be able to do this if you see this in your assessment. Hydrophobic. That is basically what I want you to know about this. Yeah, this is hydrophilic and hydrophobic area. So these are the two common balances that you need to know for this class. We now go to the next thing, the steroid hormones. Uh, steroid hormones are again those hormones that are derived from from cholesterol basically because cholesterol is the common start basic point of the synthesis of all these steroid compounds and of course they are categorized into two groups the adre adrenocorticoids and then the sex hormones i have good examples here now the sex hormone a good example is the testos testosterone the progesterone the estradiol we're going to talk more of you so this you see again they have those basic units of the steroid the cortisol is a good example of an adrenocorticoid. Again, if you look at it, if you look at this again, it has that basic cholesterol unit. And that is why we give them those names, steroid hormones, because all of them are derived from that basic ring system. So now, the adrenocorticoid hormones. Now, the adrenocorticoid hormones are produced by the adrenal cortex. They are produced by the adrenal cortex, and they are categorized based on their functions into two. The first one here is the mineral corticoid. The mineral corticoid regulate the water and salt balance in the body. They regulate homeo uh, homeostasis. They regulate the water and salt balance in the body and make sure that the body maintains a constant environment. That is homeostasis. A good example here is aldosterone. Aldosterone increases the absorption of sodium and potassium and is involved in maintaining water balance in the body. And this is a good picture of aldosterone here, which is a mineral corticoid. Mineral, minerals, that means ions, electrolyte. They maintain or regulate electrolyte. And the electrolyte we're talking about here is sodium and chloride ions. So this is the, again, you see the basic ring system. And then it has some other connections here, which again, you don't need to memorize this, but at least you need to recognize all these classes of steroid compound. This is the basic structure of uh, this is the structure of the aldosterone now we now go to the second group the glucocorticoid from the name gluco they regulate carbohydrate metabolism particularly glucose that's exactly what they do they regulate carbohydrate metabolism that is where this word comes from the glucocorticoid now a good example is the first one i showed you which is the cortisol the cortisol what does it do it increases glucose synthesis it facilitates glycogen breakdown because if you break down glycogen you are breaking down to glucose, you still get <laughs> glucose. And then if you are synthesizing glucose from non-glucose sources, which we call gluconogenesis, it also facilitates that as well. And it also plays an important role in immune response and stress. It has some important role in inflammation as well. You know, anything that has to play a role in, in, in immune response and stress will also play an important role in inflammation. And this is cortisol. This is the structure of cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid. We now go to the next one, the sex hormone. Remember, we said we divided them into, into, into two main groups, those steroid hormones. We said we divided them into, into, let's go back and visit them, into the adrenocorticoid and the sex hormone. So we just talked about adrenocorticoids, which are divided into mineral corticoids and the glucocorticoids. And now we're going to go back to the sex hormones. The sex hormones. Okay, the sex hormones are produced in men. It is it is produced by the testes, and in female, it is produced by the ovaries. In men, it is produced by the testes. In female, it is produced by the ovaries. And their basic role is to play an important role in secondary sexual characteristics that appear at puberty. And now, so we have different classes, but a few of the very simple uh, classification we we'll look at. The androgens. Androgens are the male sex hormones that are produced by the testes. 
there are a lot of them, but we're going to just talk about the commonest and the one that plays the most important role, the testosterone. The pro testosterone promotes the growth, the normal growth of male genitalia, and it is responsible for the masculinity of, of, of the males. That is exactly what the testosterone does. Now, this is the structure of the testosterone. Again, you see the A, B, C, D fuse ring system. It has the OH group at this point, and it has an a ketone group at this point and then it also has a metal group at this point and a metal group at this point so just know the function of this androgen testosterone it plays an important role in what in normal growth of male sex organs and it also like i said it promotes the growth it, it's responsible for the so-called masculinity masculinity in men yeah masculinity in men, in fish, what you see when a man grows, has a deeper voice and all those stuff, it comes from what the testosterone does. So when I go to the female sex hormone, the female sex hormone, of course, is important in productive processes, uh, childbirth, getting pregnant. So there are a couple of divisions here that we'll look at two of them mainly, the estrogen and the progesterone. The estrogen includes both the estradiol and estron. You see the name extra, extra. They are involved in the development of the ovum. Of course, the ovum needs to get ready to be fertilized. And these are the hormones that get them ready. The progesterone, on the other hand, is the one that prepares the uterus to accept fertilized egg and then maintain the resulting pregnancy until birth. It is the progesterone that maintains the result. So these are the structure. So this is the structure of progesterone. And this is the structure of extra diol again you see something common is the basic steroid nucleus the basic steroid nucleus again you don't need, you do not need to know the structures of this but just know the functions of these female sex hormones now we now talk about the icosanoids icosanoids are cyclic this is very important the cyclic compounds that are synthesized in the body from the 20 carbon that 20 carbon fatty acid is called icosa. That's all. It's an icosa. 20 means is a icosa means a Greek word for meaning 20. Icosa means 20. So this 20 carbon or icosa on saturated fatty acid is called the arachidonic acid. Now the arachidonic acid itself is synthesized from a 20 carbon long chain fatty acid called the ar arachidic acid. So this is the arachidonic acid. It is synthesized from arachi it is synthesized from arachidic acid. So what actually happens is that following trauma, now the icosanoids are generated from phospholipids. That's not from phospholipids in the cell membrane through hydrolysis of the by the enzyme phospholipase A. So what phospholipase A does in trauma or in stress or in inflammation is a series of enzymes. Includes other intermediate, but the final one that does the job is the phospholipase A, which converts this arachidic acid into arachidonic acid. Now, if you look at the structure of arachidonic acid here, he has what? He has, you see the double bond he has. If you count this thing from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, this is 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Like I said, it's a 20 carbon for that. So you find out that he has double, he has four double bonds between carbon five and six, between carbon eight and nine, between carbon 11 and 12, and between carbon 14 and 15. So it, and remember, the effect of double bond in fatty acids is that it only occurs, it makes them to be what? To be, king. it produces the king, can make them to be bent. And that bending is what, because he has four of them, is what results it to look as if it looks like a circular. It bends on its own and folds back at itself because of those four double bonds that it contains. And like I said, the enzyme that does this thing is the what? Is the phospholipase A2. The phospholipase A2. Lipase didn't come out well. Is what converts this arachidic acid into the arachidonic acid and arachidonic acid is the starting material to make the 
icosanoid, which includes the prostaglandins, the thrombosins, and the leukotrienes. So let me finish what I have in my note. I said, now, so after producing the arachidonic acid, it then undergoes a series of other reactions to produce the three classes of icosanoid, which include the prostaglandins, the thrombosins, and the leukotrienes. And we're going to see what happens here. There are two main parts that produces this from arachidonic acid. Remember, you get to this from the arachidic acid. Arachidic acid goes to this by phospholipase A. Now, arach arachidonic acid now can now be converted into those three classes. There are two parts, two main parts. The first part is catalyzed by the enzyme, the cyclooxygenase, cyclooxygenase 2, which you call the COX-2. And the second one is the, the Five lipooxygenase. Look at what it does. The arachidonic acid. This could. This involves more than, more than just simple straight conversion like I showed you. So it involves other mini mini intermediates, anyways. But just for a simplified structure, I did this myself. So the arachidonic acid now is now converted to prostag an intermediate, which we call the prostag prostaglandin intermediate by the enzyme cyclooxygenase two. The cyclooxygen, the, the, the prostaglandin intermediate then can now be converted to prostaglandin after going through a, a, fit, a bit of other intermediate or can be converted into thrombo, thrombo Z. So you see the pathway involved with COX here, COX2, produces both the prostaglandin and thrombosin. And this COX enzyme can be inhibited by the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We call them non-steroidal. Okay, wait, let me write that. Let me not bend it. So let me just say the non steroidal steroid. The non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. Drugs. That's what we call them. NS. Oh, NS. Non steroidals N S A I D L. So that's all we mean. So those no, a good example here is aspirin, is a very good example of non steroidal anti inflammatory drug, aspirin. And the aspirin can actually, that's why aspirin is used in inflammation. Because the moment these guys are produced, they play an important role in inflammatory process. Now, the other branch of uh, of of a arachidonoid is the leukotriene, which is produced by the action of what the five lipooxygenase. The five lipooxygenase can be inhibited by the lipooxygenase five. Actually, I was supposed to put five here. Five lipooxygenase inhibitors. We call them the five locks. And the five locks, because leukotrienes are highly potent. They are they, they are strong, smooth, smooth muscle activators. So, which what it means is that and they particularly do this in in like in, in in the bronchioles they, so as a result their their synthesis can lead to asthma so some of these drugs are actually used in treatment of asthma so we're going to see so the, what about a cox enzyme let's talk about it now the cyclooxygenase enzyme occurs in two forms cox1 catalyzes the normal physiological synthesis of the prostaglandins when there is no inflammation no no stress cox2 is responsible for the production of inflammation is for the production of prostaglandins during inflammation or during stress. They're the ones responsible. So what actually happens is that when a tissue is damaged or when a tissue is injured or goes through stress, special inflammatory cells will go to that area, will, will invade that area that is injured and interact with the resident cells. A good example of a resident cell could be the skeletal muscle cells, which is injured if you have like a pinch or if you wound yourself in the leg, it will now interact with it. Now, the interaction between the interaction between these resident cells and those inflammatory cells will result to what? To the activation of the COX2 enzyme. And the COX2 enzyme, the moment it's activated, it will result to the synthesis of both the prostaglandin and the prothrombosins, which are synthesized from its pathway, like I showed you. The moment this one is active, it's going to synthesize the thrombosins and the prostaglandin. And in that case, they will mediate inflammation. So prostaglandins, let's start with prostaglandins. Prostaglandins 
are like hormones. They are highly uh, bioactive since they mediate a host of body processes. And one of what they do include the following. They regulate menstruation. They prevent conception. And that is why they are used actually in, in abortion. They also induce uterine contraction, stimulate blood clotting. They, like I said, they induce induction of uterine contraction. They stimulate blood clotting. And also they initiate inflammation and fever. And because they initiate inflammation and fever, they can be inhibited by the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin. Okay, now, what are the therapeutic uses? Now, the therapeutic uses include, they can induce labor. Use, they are used for safe, you can use it to do what? For safe abortion in early pregnancy. You can use it to, so that is what they do. And two, you, they are also used as aerosol to treat asthma because they are potent smooth muscle relaxant that can be used in treating asthma. They also inhibit gastric secretions. They inhibit gastric secretions as a result they are used to treat peptic ulcers because they reduce gastric secretions. What it means is that they can be used to treat peptic ulcers. Now we go to the second class, the thrombosense. Of course, uh, okay, I didn't show you the structure. Look at the structure here. Look at it. You are not expected to memorize the structure, the structure of prostaglandin. It starts with this something that looks like a penten ring has an a, a ketone and an OH and then and if you count it is equal to 20 carbons as well you can take your time and count this okay maybe i count it a little bit this is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty so all of them are 20 carbon like i told you at the start of this concept. Now, we've talked about the therapeutic use. Let's not talk about the thrombosine. The thrombosines, like, like we said, I showed you in the flow diagram of their synthesis, also derived from arachidonic acid. And by the enzyme, COX2 is also what catalyzes the, the, the change or the transformation from arachidonic acid to the thrombosines. And then they go a few other parts to get themselves ready as thrombosines. Now, what do they do? They induce vasoconstriction vasoconstriction and platelet aggregation in fact they are strong hypertensive agent because the vasoconstriction means they can cause the contraction of the blood vessel and if there is increase in contraction of those blood vessels particularly of the large of the large blood vessels it can lead to increase in pumping of the blood and as a result it can increase the blood pressure and as a result they are deemed to be hypertensive agent Aspirin, like I told you earlier, aspirin and other non-steroidal inflammatory drugs inhibit their synthesis. Yes, inhibit their synthesis by inhibiting the COX-2 enzyme. And this is the structure. Their structure is much more peculiar. Look at what they look like. You see this hexane ring that has a ring. And then there is this O that shows to be behind the ring. You know, this looks like something behind that you cannot see. I didn't put the wedge and the wedge. I drew this myself. I didn't put both the wedge and the dash because that's made a little bit confusing for you guys. So I decided to keep it simple this way. Now, this is an example of thrombosine A2. Again, this is how they look like. And like I said, you look at the kind of ring they have, which is different from the prostaglandin has. The first ring they have here looks like a pentel ring. This is like a hexen ring. Okay, let's now go. To the last but not the least, the leukotrins. The leukotrins themselves are synthesized from arachidonic acid, of course. The enzyme that synthesizes them is the 5 lipooxygenase enzyme. And that's why I told you they are inhibited by the 5 lipooxygenase inhibitors. Of course, they were first isolated in the leukocyte. That is mainly where they are produced, leukocyte or white blood cells. What they do is that they initiate muscle contractions, especially in the lungs and the bronchioles. They initiate strong muscle, smooth muscle contraction, especially in the lungs and the bronchioles. The lungs and the bronchioles. What is the implication? Is that they can cause asthma-like attack, an allergic response. That's exactly what they do. And what they do is that when these responses are there, they also sustain those responses. And this could be debilitating for someone who is an asthma sufferer. Now, the drugs, what drugs are used in controlling them? 
the five lipooxygenase inhibitors are drugs which inhibit their synthesis and as a result these drugs are used in what in the treatment of asthma the five lux enzymes are used in treatment of asthma or asthmatic attacks and look at their structure now i said this thing earlier i don't know if i said it you see they lack the ring system look at the other two has the ring system the other two have the ring system the prostaglandin and uh, uh and the and the thrombosin the leukotrins do not have the ring system however they still have these four double bonds which makes them loop again like a ring and they have this eta group here so this is what they look like again and again when you count them they're also made up of 20 carbon atoms let's count one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty so this is this is a leukotriene molecule and having said that we've come to the end of this lecture thank you for listening bye